Hello and welcome to another episode of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have back with us Dan Kuhn. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeff. Good to be back. Glad to have you, as always. Dan, we're going to get right into it today. The book, Ruthless, Scientology, My Son, David Miscavige, and Me by Ron Miscavige with Dan Kuhn. Dan, you basically ghost wrote the book for Ron Miscavige, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Now, there's been some uh, some questions by Marty Rathbun about the integrity of the entire process. So today, you know, I wanted our listeners to hear from you about fact-checking, how the publisher, St. Martin's, did everything, how their lawyers, what you did. Could, could you give us, like, the overall view of the book, how it came about and how it was fact-checked? Yeah, um, this is something I think I brought up in our last podcast, but uh, after Ron got out, and Steve Hall and I had sort of been connected up back with him and we were, you know, we would talk about different things. And we both suggested that Ron write a book. He said, man, I, I, you know, I told him, listen, you could, you could really write one hell of a book. You could, you could, you could uh, expose what, what's going on with the church and with your son and so on. And he didn't want to do it. He said, no, I don't, you know, I'm just not, I just want to live my life. I want to, play my music and I want to sell extra genies, which is this exercise device he's been using for 50 years and he's still in tremendous shape. So it's obviously works. It's workable. At any rate, um, what happened was, you know, the PIs were following him for a year and a half and they finally got busted. And, you know, again, Steve and I are on him saying, oh, Ron, you got to write a book. You got to write a book. He didn't want to write a book. And what made him decide to write the book, which we cover in a specific thing, is he went down there to try to reconnect with his daughters, Denise and Lori, after they had disconnected from him. When he came out, they had been back in touch with him. Everything was great. They talked uh, several times a week or maybe almost every day, and they exchanged messages. They're, they're Basically, the family got put back together. And then Dave started putting pressure on them to, quote unquote, sort out his scene with the church. And eventually both Lori first and then Denise stopped communicating with him. And that uh, Ron and Becky decided in September, I believe it was September 2014, they were going to drive down to Clearwater and try to reestablish the connection. And neither of the daughters would speak to them. And at that point, Ron decided he was going to write a book because he realized that, first of all, he had nothing more to lose. And he decided that he had to speak up and do something about this disconnection policy that the church uses to destroy families. So that's when he decided to uh, finally take the bulls by the horn and start writing the book. Contrary to what anyone else says, like some people have said, it's a, it's just a cash grab and this and that. But he wasn't he was willing to let this whole PI thing just go by the boards. But when his daughters cut all the communication, that's when he decided he had to speak up. And then did he contact you and say, Dan, can you help me with the project? Well, we talked often. You know, we were talking several times a week anyway. And he said, you know, something he told me about what happened when he went down there. And he says, you know, something I'm going to write a book. Well, about a month or so later, uh, my wife and I were out in Los Angeles visiting uh, her son and his family. And so I flew back with my little recorder and we, I sat in Ron's, at Ron's uh, table in his living room and we talked for three days straight. I asked him questions. He told me his story. I got maybe, I must have gotten 30 or 40 hours of recordings. And I came back here and wrote a draft of the book and we would discuss different things as in, in the intervening weeks and months and I finished a draft in about three months went back over saw him again we polished it up and then we started looking for a publisher and an agent so there was definitely um, a lot of back and forth you know obviously I, I sort of took what he gave me and I wrote the story I wasn't uh, as a ghostwriter I don't feel it's my province to try to uh, influence the voice of the author, the person who's going to be fronting for the book. So I, you know, I kept my opinions to myself. I did have input and I, when I, something wasn't clear to me, I would ask further questions and ask for further explanations on things. And that, of course, occurred a lot. But we were pretty happy with the, uh, the final product and I'm, I'm still pretty happy with it today. When you sent out 
proposals uh, to publishers, St. Martin's came back and said we're interested. What, what happens when St. Martin's said we're interested? Well, they they were uh, they got a hold of our agent and they, and they wanted to uh, they wanted to buy the book, so they prepared a contract. And you know, Ron is is really the author of the book, or he's the one fronting for it. So he you know he signed the contract, and then that began uh, the editing process because St. Martin's they they placed some limits on how long the book could be. They wanted it to be under eighty thousand words. So they had some of their conditions, and then they, their editor, Karen Walney, who's the, the top editor at St. Martin's, started going working with us to, to clarify things, to smooth out, uh, answer questions, you know, that didn't, she didn't feel were answered uh, well enough because Ron and I, both being longtime Scientologists, sort of took certain things for granted. And she brought those things to light and made us clarify things. And she wanted things worded in, in uh, different ways or just to, to, you know, to clarify the communication better. And so her work was extremely helpful. And I think it gave us a much better uh, and much more even handed uh, final final draft to go out to the public. Now, uh, now St. Martin's would have concerns about the church wanting to sue over the book. And so their lawyers would get involved. What what was the legal process of vetting the details? Oh yeah, okay. Well, that that was quite something. Uh, Ron and I spent uh, probably a, five or six weeks with two or three phone calls a week, going over uh, points with a lawyer, and he he nitpicked this thing to bits. Uh, you know, most of which, you know, we would sometimes argue things out and he would see our point. And, uh, but a lot of times he had, he had points because like you say, St. Martin's was concerned about getting into uh, a legal fight that they had no interest in getting into. So that um, everything is, that, that appears in the book is legally defensible. And a lot of it was just uh, wording changes here and there that uh, Ron and I expressed it one way. He suggested the lawyer suggested another way of expressing it, which was fine with us because we we just wanted to uh, tell the story and get get the story out there. This was a lawyer who worked for St. Martin's, and he was okay. he was responsible for vetting, uh, you know, vetting the book from a legal standpoint. Is something we're saying could that be inflammatory? Could that bring the wrath of the church legal team, you know, the fa phalanx of lawyers that David Miscavige surrounds himself, could that bring those guys down on St. Martin's? And they, they wanted no part of that. Now, one thing that, that Marty Rathbun was critical about, he said the book contained hearsay. Marty did not cite any examples. And that's what I mean specifically for, for him to say the book has hearsay. Well, where are your examples? Please give me at least, you know, 10 examples. Yeah, well, Marty's correct in that for, for a year, I mean, David dropped out of high school on his 16th birthday and joined the Sea Org. And for even though Ron uh, would see him when he went down to flag, they would they would always were always cordial and always, you know, uh, father, son again. And although they talked on the phone and although they wrote letters and stuff, he, Ron was not around him between, I guess, 1976 uh, to 1985. So about nine years, he was not in the same level of contact that he had been throughout the first 16 years of his life. So in that, in that regard, Marty's, Marty's uh, correct in that. However, um, there are people who are just every bit as reliable as Marty as an eyewitness to some of the things that David Miscavige did on his rise to power. And we consulted with several of those people, uh, probably uh, three or four, maybe half a dozen people who had worked with David in the, in the CMO, who had roomed with him, who had been friends with him, and uh, these people's their recollections. There's no reason for any of us to doubt the recollections that they that they uh, how they recall things. So, so there there are there are passages in the book, particularly in that period, say 82, 83, 84, and there, where uh, you know Ron is relying on the accounts of other people. Which have also, which have further been corroborated by others. So there's no reason to to call into their uh, to call their accounts into question. I don't think. 
Well, for example, I've interviewed Mark Fisher se several times. Yeah. And he was with uh, David Miscavige during that period where, where Dave is at ASI. You know, he, there's, I think, seven years in there. Yeah. So you, you, you talked to Mark Fisher. Absolutely, we talked to Mark, and we got a lot of information about him. Mark was the corporate liaison in charge, meaning he was the guy who was responsible for coordinating um, the actions between the church and author services. So he, he was like, like you said, the corporate liaison. That was his post title, and he he knew everything. I mean, he he's the one who gave us the information about how uh, DM got the OT materials, quote unquote, from Pat Broker. And, and even Marty himself has recounted that on his blog. Yeah, that's right. So there's a lot of historical facts that have been established by eyewitnesses. Yeah, and that that speaks to the book's credibility. The Church of Scientology itself put up a hate site attacking the book. But that, to me, is unremarkable uh, because every book that comes out or even, you know, Going Clear or, or newspaper article they've attacked, you know, go down the list of people who've written things on the church. Yeah, that's what they do. Dan, in terms of the integrity of Ruthless, you did very serious work with the St. Martin's attorney. St. Martin stands behind it. You have contemporary you know, or, or eyewitnesses who were there. Yep, yep. And do you, you stand behind the book 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ron, yeah, Ron Miscavige Sr. does. Yep. Did you read Marty's criticisms of the book? Yeah. Yeah, I, I read it. And uh, I'll just take up a couple of points. The first thing, he you know, he says in his review that he had advised Ron not to write a book because it would have, you know, deleterious effects on him, you know, emotionally and spiritually and so on. I, in fact, I talked to Ron recently. He, he claims that Marty is just making that up. He says he, he Ron asserts that that um, Marty never advised him not to write a book, and and in fact Ron himself was never going to write a book. They spoke uh, quite frequently after Ron left in 2012. He connected up, you know, he got in contact with Marty, and they had many conversations, but nothing ever revolved around writing or not writing a book. He, Ron says that's just. Marty's just making that up. You're in good contact with uh, Ron Miscavige Sr. And I'll leave that to uh, Mr. Rathman to comment on. Okay. Now, something else that's happened is Marty has criticized Louis Theroux's upcoming movie on Scientology. Marty made a comment about the, the central scene, which have you seen the trailer where the, the David Miscavige character? Yeah, yeah. Now, to you, does that seem like David Miscavige at full throttle? No, it seems like David Miscavige at about half throttle. I mean, nobody, and I posted a comment on Tony Ortega's blog today, nobody can blow his stack like David Miscavige. And so whatever whatever was done uh, in the film, whatever whatever was recreated is, is probably one, one fifth or one half of what David Miscavige is capable of. And that guy, can he can really lose it. Can you give examples of times you saw him lose it or physically assault people? Well, I remember one one time, and one time specifically, we were uh, uh, in 1996 during the whole golden age of tech evolution, there were command teams, which are groups of people that are going to be going out to the continental organizations in Scientology throughout over the world. And they're going to be sort of taking command of those areas. And he called called them all up to the qualifications building and at Gold for a briefing. But before then, he wanted Ray and myself to come up there. So Ray and I went up there. And then the minute David walked in, he walked up to Ray and just started kicking him in the ass. And he kicked him hard in the butt three times. And Ray just sort of took it. And I had I had no idea what brought that on because there was no conversation prior to it. He just walked in and, and kicked him three times. And to me, it was a slightly amusing because Ray is very tall and David is very short. And to see this little guy kicking this big guy in the ass and the, the big guy taking it was kind of, you know, at the time I'd been sleeping two hours a night for several months. And, and that that's it just sort of impressed me as, as being a bit strange. It got worse and worse as time went on. You can't really compare Scientology under David Miscavige with the corporate world, you have to compare it to the North Korea or uh, Iraq under Saddam or 
Libya under Gaddafi because those people had ultimate power and they 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 were the uh, they made the rules and that's the way David is that that's the way DM is in Scientology he makes the rules. Dan, we have a series of books written by people like Nancy Maney. Yep. And we have Blown for Good by Mark Headley, Jenna Miscavige. You know, and you start you start going down the list of the great books that are written out there. Yep. Even going back to the 80s, you have Russell Miller, John A. Tack, both exceptional books. Yeah. You go back to the 70s with Paulette Cooper's Scandal of Scientology, George Malko's book. The one, the one thing these books all have in common is that they have been seriously attacked by the church. That's right. The church cannot respond to criticism because Mr. Hubbard said, always attack, never defend. Yes. That's his policy. And that's one of the knocks on the church is why don't you have a meaningful dialogue with culture? The, the term that, that Mr. Rathbun is using, the anti-Scientology community, uh -huh. I take objection to that because I've never objected to Scientology. I'm saying get all the auditing you want, practice the tech all you want. I'm opposed to the human rights abuses. That's to clarify my position. I, I think, I think there's probably 90% of the people that are critical of Scientology are critical for the exact same reason. Yes, and wh why would you object to someone getting auditing? I'm not stopping the delivery of Scientology organizations. Right. I, I'm, I'm trying to draw attention, as you are, to the human rights abuses. And look, these two PIs had weapons on them. They had a silencer. David Miscavige says to the PIs, and they tell this to the police. It's, it's all there on the taped interviews. If he dies, let him die. Yeah. And even then, Ron Scavage Sr. shows restraint. He he didn't want to he didn't want to write a book. He he realized that this disconnection policy that's that's the thing that tipped him over the edge. Dan, because you like to stay behind the scenes, and, you know, make things happen, and I understand that. People want to know more about you. What drew you into Scientology? What year did you get into into Scientology, and why? At the time. I was uh, going to the University of California in Berkeley in the in the late 60s, and that was a time when anything went, and that was, you know, as you know, is the the center of the whole student protest movement, and there were anti-war demonstrations, and there was Hare Krishnas, and I was doing transcendental meditation, and anything went in, in that in that city for for all those years that I was there, and so Scientology was just sort of another one of the uh, things happening in Berkeley at the time. And my brother, who is clear number 88, who uh, got me and uh, a couple of friends, good friends from college, interested in it. And so we started taking courses at the, uh, did the communications course, which is the basic course that teaches the training routines that we discussed last time. You know, we did that course and then did other courses and just sort of, it just sort of, you know, pretty much ha it, you know, was sort of an, happened organically. It just, it wasn't any big decision I made to get involved in it. But I, the more I learned about it, the more it seemed to, you know, answer questions I had. And um, again, it was just sort of part of the environment in Berkeley at that time. That's how I got involved. So I worked at the mission for a few years and I went to Los Angeles and went to AOLA and did the clearing course and OT levels and, um, stayed down there and did the briefing course at ASHO. And then uh, the following year, I got recruited for the SO. Now, what year, what year did you join the Sea Org? 1977. So you, you had really, had you gone up the bridge to OT7 when you joined the Sea Org? No, I was uh, OT4, the old OT4 at the time. Now, that's pretty interesting. Many people in the Sea Org, aren't even clears when they join. Yeah. That's, yeah. A lot of uh, Guillaume Lesev, who's the ED int, he, he had been in, he had found out about Scientology and I guess he'd been in about two weeks and he joined the Sea Org. A lot of people, some people do that. Oh yeah. They jump uh, right in yeah. head first into things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I know people like that to just dive in. So you being an OT4, when you join the Sea Org, did that give you kind of uh, some altitude within the Sea Org? Maybe better p posting than you would have gotten otherwise? No, not at all. Not at all. I, I, was, I was recruited to be uh, one of the auditors in the qualifications division. 
like in um, in a Scientology organization, the auditing occurs in what's called Div 4, the technical division. But in a, because there were no public where we were at the at the, in, at the base in La Quinta, uh, all the auditors were in the qualifications division, and they sort of were f responsible for the staff enhancement, which was their auditing. Okay, now let me let me get this straight. You join the Sea Org and you go right to Int Base. I mean, you're cleared to go to Int Base. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of us were. I I was out. I actually, I'd been auditing at the Lake Tahoe mission. Uh, throughout the end of 1976, came back down in 1977, and then I just got contacted by uh, a couple of Sea Org members who were sent on a recruit mission by LRH to to get some auditors for the quality. And now, what, what class of auditor were you, if I may ask? Uh, class 6, which is a St. Hill Special Briefing Course graduate. So when, when you arrive at base, what's your... Uh, experience between public being a public Scientologist and being a member of the elite in base where Mr. Hubbard works? Uh, that's that's an interesting question and it's uh, <laughs> well, I mean it's a major life change to go from you know going to the org to get some auditing to suddenly you know you're right right in the center of at the action for the entire international church. Yeah well let me tell you about it we were uh, in the desert, in the, in the uh, La Quinta is sort of in the the low desert, south and east of Palm Springs, and it man, I got there in the middle of June, and it was just hotter than hell. The schedule uh, at the base, we got up at 4:30 in the morning, and we had breakfast at uh, about five o'clock, and by 5:30 we were doing TRs, and if if you're not used to getting up early, doing TR0 at 5.30 in the morning is kind of a rough go. Um, the, the whole schedule was worked the, work the way it was because in the middle of the day, which was a very, very hot, it was like probably 120 degrees every day there. We had a meal time, we had study time for the crew, we had exercise time and, and so on. So the, people were out of the sun, out of the heat for, uh, maybe between 10:30, 11, and maybe 3, 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock. But after that, you would then go back, you would do some more work on your post or whatever, and then uh, you would secure at about 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night and get up at 4.30 the next morning. So it was a very, very strange schedule, and it was not – it really took some, some getting used to. I can imagine, especially coming down from the Lake Tahoe mission. Yeah, no kidding. Just in the – in the change of climate, oh, yeah. um, you worked on staff enhancement, mean, meaning that you audited other Sea Org members? Yeah, I was a staff auditor. A bunch of us had been recruited uh, at that same time, and we were, um, you know, the new auditors, and we were sort of going to be, LRH said that he always had to keep a few sharks around to keep other people honest, and he was going to turn us into sharks, meaning uh, top-notch <laughs> auditors, top-notch tech people. It didn't, it didn't work out that way because a month later, the FBI raided the church and LRH took off and didn't come back for five months. But uh, meanwhile, things sort of progressed. And, you know, uh, what we mainly ended up doing was a lot of sec checking. That was that, that was that was what we learned how to do was just start sec checking the crew for their their overts and withholds. You get to in base and suddenly how did you learn that the fbi had raided the church of scientology i mean does you know the day of the raid uh lrh was gone and we got briefed that there there'd been a raid what did they say in the briefing what details did they give you did they did they for example did they give you the we were raided because we stole government copy or paper story oh no 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 we were we were briefed that the fbi you know uh raided the church unjustly and we're going to overturn the case and blah, 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 blah. But it was all presented as, you know, we're under attack and we got to circle the wagons and uh, it's unjust and as it always is. Did that cause you any kind of cognitive dissonance to think that your church had been raided? I don't recall. I don't recall it. I just sort of, I mean, that first month was so weird, you know, standing standing in the, the swimming pool with uh, leather boots on to shrink them and make them fit my foot to avoid the rattlesnakes that would be on the path. And, you know, just uh, there was all these, there were so many new things to adjust to. 
that the fact of a, a raid was just, oh, well, that was sort of over there, really, to be honest with you. To me, it was over there. Is it like in for a penny, in for a pound? Yeah. I don't think people can fully appreciate the the intensity of the Sea Org. Yeah, a year in the Sea Org was sort of the equivalent to a, of a lifetime of experience, and there were several years where that was the case. You go f from uh, auditing staff to really focusing on, on sec checking people. Why is there the emphasis on sec checking at the base? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that, you know, LRH, I think that he ended up using that as, as a control mechanism to keep people introverted, to keep them, uh, you know, stuck in their heads looking at what they did rather than all the abuses going on around them. In what ways did you see uh, LRH change after the raid? How does how does the raid affect the organization as L. Ron Hubbard runs it? Were there more sec checks after this, the 1977 raid? Well, he took off and then came back at the beginning of 1978, and we basically we just we just launched right into making tech films. So we we were so isolated at that base in La Quinta that. We, you know, we, we didn't receive any further briefings on what was going on. I do remember that before he came back, there was a big evolution to get rid of a lot of potentially damaging um, documents because the GO was the top people in the GO were at the base. And Mary Sue was there and uh, Jimmy Mulligan and Ann Mulligan were there and uh, Nikki Merwin, who was Mary Sue's communicator. These are sort of these uh, longtime legendary GO people. They were all still there. And when LRH, before he came back, there was a massive evolution to burn uh, documents, burn papers. I mean, there were there were box, boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff taken out to the one of the fireplaces on the property and just burned. And then when he, the, the GO left, Mary Sue left, uh, all the GO people left and then LRH came back. So there was definitely uh, a, a distance between LRH and the GO at that point. And plus there's a, a, an enormous amount, as you said, of document destruction. Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. Now you as a CERG member, were you allowed to have any interaction at all with Guardian's office personnel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were they were around all the time. I mean, uh, you know, other of the qual auditors were auditing some of the geo people, and uh, they would, you know, the geo people. They were they were just other uh, staff members on the base. Well, the reason I ask in the Miscavige era, Miscavige denounces the Guardian's office as criminal. Well, they were, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they were. But in, in the uh, after the raid, they they weren't viewed as criminal at that time because you were working with them. W were there any guardians' office being purged? Not not on not at the uh, La Quinta base. That's for sure. Everyone was still there. Uh, they were still. I guess they were sort of directing uh, the strategy of how to deal with this. So there was a lot of work going on that I wasn't privy to, that's for sure. But the people were still there and they were still, you know, they would, you'd see them at meals and they would get audited and, and so on. But things definitely changed when LRH came back. They were long gone. Well, when LRH comes back, do you, is that when you go into helping him make films? Yeah, he, he launched right into making the tech films right after, uh, in January of uh, 1978. Now the tech films... Uh, my understanding of them, Hubbard wanted to, to be able to show Scientologists how certain things are done. So what was the emphasis on the tech films? Like what specific things did he want to address? Primarily uh, the, the communication protocols, which are called TRs, and the metering protocols. When we first arrived, uh, in 1977, before he took off, he had give, he came down to Qual and gave uh, some a few lectures to the to all of us Qual auditors, and uh, he said that uh, a PC has to be interested in his own case and willing to talk to the auditor, and those those fundamentals of the PC interest. Uh, has to do with how well the auditor can make the e-meter read and how how well it can disclose uh, things that are bothering the PC. 
and willing to talk to the auditor relates to uh, does the does the preclear does the person being audited feel comfortable talking and uh, you know unburdening a lot of his traumas and secrets and so on to to another person so TRs and metering were sort of the the focus of all the tech films the first one being uh the, the the tech film on TRs. Oh, that's the one where you played Joe Howard. Yeah, that's the one where I was uh, the, the quote unquote the star of the film. You work on uh, you work on tech films, and then do you move from there into uh, compilations unit? Pretty much, I went back and I went back to qual uh, auditing and so on, and then uh, I think the the following year, then I went to compilations. Yeah, nineteen seventy nine. So you were in the Sea Org when the Guardian's office was still in existence. Yeah. Which is pretty interesting, which makes you a very long-term Sea Org member. How many total years did you spend in the Sea Org? Uh, I left for... uh, from since 1977. I left right at the end of 2003, so it would be about 26 and a half years. Well, when's the last time you saw Mr. Hubbard speak or saw Mr. Hubbard in person? I think the following year, 1979, we were shooting – uh, we were still at the La Quinta base. We hadn't moved to the, the Hemet base. And we were, uh, I was going out to do a shot of a, a title shot for one of the tech films. And uh, we were driving down the road and we ran into him and he, you know, he said, hi, how's it, how's it going? What's going on? And he said, we're just out to take a shot. And he said, okay, have a good day type of thing. That was probably the last time I saw him in person. There were many communications over the years after that, but that was probably the last time I actually saw him in person. Yeah, and that's part of life. You never know when it's the last time you're going to see anybody. Yeah, yeah. Now, when L. Ron Hubbard died in January of 1986, how was it announced at the base? Uh, it was not announced at the base. Everyone was said, we're going down for a briefing. We're going down to Los Angeles. So were you, were you sent to the Palladium event? Yeah, yeah. And what happened was the the weekend... That was the, uh, the, the the event occurred on a Monday. Sunday was the Super Bowl when Chicago stomped uh, the New England Patriots. And uh, I was over at, uh, there's a, a sort of a legendary Sea Org member named Gary Weesey. I was over at his little bungalow. We were ready to watch the game. He got called off for something, which had to do with, obviously with this event that was going to happen the next day. He never came back. So I sat there and watched the game by myself and enjoyed myself. And then the next day, we all were told, you know, we're going down to uh, an event at the Palladium. It was hush, hush, top secret, and no one knew what was happening until we got there. So the event opens. David Miscavige walks on stage. Yeah. How well did you know David Miscavige at this time? I'd say I knew him pretty well. I mean, we had um, had many interactions. You know, we had um, – I didn't – I hadn't worked with him a lot. But everyone knew DM and everyone sort of respected him. And he had been down at ASI and I'd done some work for him at ASI, writing liner notes for albums and stuff like that. So I, you know, I knew him fairly well. So it was no surprise to you uh, when he walked on stage. The reason I asked is for many Scientology publics, that was the first time they ever saw David Miscavige. Yeah, that's right. To us, though, he, he was, you know... By 1986, everyone knew he was uh, the boss buffalo, so it was no surprise to see him come out first. You know, in the in the sewer, when uh, L. Ron Hubbard dies, there's a power struggle between David Miscavige and Pat Broker. You, I think you said for two years? Yeah, it, it got resolved, uh, I guess, sometime mid-1987, maybe late 1987. And then clearly David Miscavige uh, emerges as the winner of the power struggle. Yeah. That's right. And then he he leaves uh, Author Services International and becomes chairman of the Board Religious Technology Center. Correct. What what was your understanding of what RTC was and what it should what it's supposed to do? My relationship being now back into RTRC, my relationship was that RTC and particularly Ray Medoff as Inspector General for Tech and David Miscavige as the chairman of the board were the final authority authorization terminals for what I was working on, the, the courses and bulletins and things like that. Before then, RTC was just sort of these mysterious, like a, uh, the, the year prior I had been in gold 
and was, you know, on various posts, not, nothing remarkable. But uh, RTC was always these, they were the top dogs and they were the ones that you, you know, saluted when they came by and uh, respected for sure. And when he came back up in 19, I guess in the spring of 87, he started cleaning house and Vicki Asneran was gone and Jesse Prince was gone. And a lot of people were gone and some people stayed. Uh, basically, he took anyone who was in broker's camp, he got rid of them and the people who were on in his side, he kept. Yeah, and that, that's an, an interesting period where he's he's realigning the church. So command intention becomes you're on David Miscavige's side. That's right. Now, shifting gears slightly, when is the first time you met Ron Miscavige Sr.? He had come to the base uh, in the early 1980s. This is several years before he joined the Sea Org. He had come to the base with his band, and they played at a, uh, a, a May 9th event. So that was the first time I met him. And then uh, a year or two later, I was down at ASI... I'd been called down there to write some liner notes copy for one of the music albums. It was either Edgar Winter's album or Chick Corea's uh, album or something like that. I drove the van the next day. You know, David stayed up all night doing stats or whatever it was. And I drove the van back the next day with him sleeping on the floor in the back of the van. When I got back to the base, Ron was there visiting and he, he grabbed Dave and, uh, picked him up his arms and carried him into his room. David, you know, David had been up all night and he was, he was zonked out and uh, Ron picked him up and carried him into his bedroom. And that was the second time I met him. And did, and once Ron joins the Sea Org, he's at the base where you're stationed. Yeah, he, he was, he spent some time on the EPF down in Los Angeles, meaning the estates project for us, which is just sort of an orientation to Sea Org life. And then uh, he came up to the base. So, and we, sort of developed a friendship, uh, interests in, you know, exercise and philosophy of Scientology and different things and music. So we always hit it off well. So you knew Ron Miscavige Sr. for many years. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things, you know, karmically, you never realized that someday you would help him tell his story. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Dan, have you read uh, The Church of Scientology's Hate website on Ron Miscavige Sr.? I, I looked at a few things, and there, the, the thing that sort of uh, really surprised me was some of these videos that people who had worked with him for years and were considered very close friends and who uh, had, you know, they, they'd been, they'd, like I said, they'd worked together for maybe 20 years, now trashing the guy. And you know that there was off right, you know, right outside the camera frame, there was a gun being pointed at these people's heads. It also brought brought up the brings up the point that uh, most of these videos that they that they had were sort of glowing uh, uh, reviews of David Miscavige and maybe 10% trashing Ron. But it also totally contradicts the fact that David Miscavige says he he doesn't run the church, he doesn't run Scientology, but yet he's I think we mentioned it. You brought it up last week. He, he's uh, figuring out the kitchen in the in the ut kitchen utensils in the in the galley, and he's determining, you know, how the rooms are going to be painted in the new birthing building and stuff. This guy micromanages everything. Yeah, and I wrote an article for Tony Ortega about that's a big contradiction between what he said in the Rathbun versus Miscavige lawsuit. I have nothing to do with running the daily affairs of the church. On this video, he's getting down into the actual skillets in the kitchen, I guess, you know, the carpeting in the apartments. Yeah. But, but you know, because Sea Org has such a tight bond, my sense of the uh, smear website on Ramon Scavage Sr., yeah. there was obviously a feeling of betrayal. You betrayed the group. And you see Peter Schles, who worked on the famous, on Jeffrey Osborne's song, On the Wings of Love. Yeah. I thought Peter Schles really dishonored himself. He didn't come across as sincere in the video when he you know, when he made unkind remarks about Ron. Yeah. Nor did his fellow musicians. Yeah, all those guys dishonored themselves, every single one of them. I, I know all those people, and they were very good friends with Ron. They were very good friends with me. I was friends with all the musicians. And uh, Russ Grelick, who was a sound mixer, and uh, Rick Krusen and Peter Schles. I knew all those guys very, very well. And they, like you say, they really dishonored themselves. And they're going to, at some point, they'll probably live to regret it. 
Dan, let me ask you this, because there's something I really want to know, and the public wants to know. When Ron Miscavige Sr. was in the Sea Org, was he held in high esteem on his own merits, or is it as they're accusing of, he, he got to slide by on the ice? No, he, he was a very, very competent musician. He ran the music department. He, he was very well liked by everybody because he's a, he's a garrulous person. He's very, a very social personality. He, he goes out of his way to talk to people and make jokes. And uh, I mean, he does a thing today. I, I've, I've seen him do this. He'll, he goes, uh, he'll be like in a Walmart in, in Milwaukee. You know, see a little kid, you know, go up and he's just start talking to the little kid and say, hey, what's your name? And the kid will say, you know, Johnny or whatever and say, Johnny, you know something? The birthday man has been after me to find you and give you this. And he'll hand the kid a dollar. He'll just, he'll just walk up to some <laughs> kid in line, you know, waiting with his mother in line. And the mother gets all the kid. The kid, of course, just lights up. You know, his eyes just get big and big smile. And his mother's so grateful and this and that. But he, that's just the way he is. That's the way he goes through life. He, he likes people and he just does stuff like that all the time. I, I've, I've known him for many years and this, that's, that's who the guy is. Yeah. And there's, so there's quite a, quite a disconnect because the, um, the tenor of the hate website on Ron senior is that, and, and again, they do this, the church of Scientology does this to Sea members who leave a low ranking, nobody who just got by and the church is better off since he left or she left. Yeah. That was the impression of the hate website is, oh, we had to be deferential to him because he was David Miscavige's father, but he really didn't have any talent as a musician. Now, I've seen the videos of Ron, Ron playing. He's a knockout trumpet player. Yeah, he's very, very competent. I mean, he, he's been playing music since he was like 13 years old. I mean, that's like, what, 67 years of playing music. If, if he was no good, he would have given up by the time he was 14. Oh, he would have been cut from the band, but you see yeah. at the uh, Tom Cruise's $400,000 birthday party, the church threw for him on the free winds. Yeah. Ron's in the band. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ron and, Ron was always, he fronted the band. He was the most outgoing of all the musicians. Uh, you know, the horn, you know, a horn stands out in, in, in a band. So he, he was the, he was the obvious leader of that, that group. When he was in the Sea Org, was he viewed as a man of integrity? I think so. I mean, I, I don't know anyone that ever had any problems with him. That's the thing. Yeah. Like he was, he was well liked. Uh, he talked to everybody. He knew everybody. Everybody knew him. He was friends with everybody. Everybody was friends with him. It's just that, that, that smear website is, it's a it's a an utter fabrication. I I haven't watched everything. I just it was just like okay, I see where this is going. But uh, I watched a few of the videos and that was it. Well, I appreciate your insights. I went into the website in detail, but I, I I'm a a researcher, so I have a different yeah pur purpose for going into there. I I I want to see what they're doing in terms of their propaganda, their party line. Yeah, I understand. But it's, it's great to hear from you, Sea Org member who knew Ron f for a long time. Yeah. A friend of long duration, as you might say in Scientology. That's right. Yeah. And and so Ron Miscavige Sr. stands behind the book Ruthless. You absolutely. stand behind the the book Ruthless. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I'm. Someone asked me on Facebook the other day to to to, to write a review of it, write my own critique of the book, and he asked if it was did it hold up as a as a documentary piece and as a piece of literature. And I said, yes, it definitely holds up as a, a piece of good documentation. Everything, Ron was very sincere in, in wanting to make the book educational for people because he wants to do something about this policy of disconnection. That was his entire reason for writing the book. Yeah, and I just want to point out that the book was good enough for St. Martin's and it became a New York Times bestseller. Yeah. So we're talking about a substantial book. Now, do you find it ironic, Dan, one, one question in closing? St. Martin's was the publisher of Battlefield Earth. Yeah, I thought that was uh, interestingly ironic, ironically interesting. Yeah, I, I did too. They published Battlefield Earth, and then they, they come back, and that was, uh, I forget the year Battlefield Earth was released. 82 or something I, like that. Yeah, and then they come back and they issue uh, Ramos Cabbage Sr.'s book. Yeah. It's just one of those interesting things in the publishing world. 
I read the book. I thought it had a great deal of integrity. I've written several books, and that's each one, you know, the voice of the, the author, the voice of the person who's fronting for the book comes through, I think. So that's, I, I, I do take a little bit of pride in that. And Ron liked the work you did, obviously. Oh, yeah. And he had the final say-so on the manuscript. Absolutely. I mean, if, if, if I suggested something, he didn't like it, he said, no, he said, take that out. I mean, he, he left out a lot of stuff that we could have put in there. We, we were under some length restrictions from St. Martin. Still, there were things that he just, he wanted to be as fair and as even-handed as he could be about what he thought was good about Scientology and what he thought thinks is bad about it today, what he thought was good about Hubbard, what he thinks is bad about Hubbard. He offers some reforms that he thinks would, would do a lot to restore the credibility of the church. And so he, he had an idea to reach as wide an audience as possible and, you know, really sincerely try to educate people. Dan, I really appreciate you coming on the show today to just clarify this current controversy. I'm glad to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Yeah, so to speak. I'm glad to be there. Glad to be here. And uh, if uh, there's anything else I can help you with, just let me know. I will. And I, we do appreciate you taking the time to clarify these issues. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening. And as always, we'll be in very good touch.